Babylonians, Mayans, programmers, dozen lists, extremely cool YouTubers. All of these people have either used or advocated for an alternative base that isn't decimal. However, all of these bases have one thing in common. As you may be able to tell, they're all even. Now using an even base is a very good idea. One way that you can assess how useful a base is, is how to handle simple fractions. And the simplest fraction that most people will use in their everyday lives is easily one half. If you have an even base B, then the actual numerical representation of one half will always have a single digit, 0 0.B over 2. Clearly, if you have an odd base, then this won't work. In general, representations of fractions will only terminate if the prime factors of the denominator of the fraction, when reduced to lowest terms, is a subset of the base itself's prime factors. And by definition, 2 will never be a factor of an odd number. So in any odd base, halves have a repeating digit. It'll always only be one digit, which isn't too bad, but if you forget to write the bar over it, then suddenly you've written a completely different number. That's not good. But there is one thing that odd bases can do that doesn't often get talked about. For that, we must revisit what it means to write a number in a certain base. In all the standard bases, or positional number systems to give them their fancy name, the digits used to represent numbers in base B will be from 0 to B minus 1. So in decimal, base 10, we use the digits from 0 to 9. Notice how they will always represent positive quantities, so to express a negative number, you must add a minus sign in front of the number's absolute value. What if instead the sign of a number could be encoded within the digits themselves? And this is where sign digit representations come into play, and a particular type which I like to call balanced bases. Just a quick disclaimer, technically these balanced bases are only one type of sign digit representation, there are several others, for example, twos and tens complement that you might have heard of, but I'm focusing on balanced bases in this video. Anyway, with all that out of the way, what on earth is a balanced base? In a balanced base, every positive digit has an equal and opposite negative digit. You also have zero, so when you take all the pairs of digits in zero, you see that the only way to make a truly balanced base is to use an odd base. If you try to balance an even base, like decimal, you would have to skew it either in favor of positive or negative digits. The smallest way, therefore, to make a truly balanced base is to just have the digits 1 and negative 1, which when you include 0, makes 3 digits. So we can call this base balanced ternary, as in balanced base 3. Lots of earlier computers used ternary, either regular or balanced, as they saw the value of using trit, the ternary equivalent of the bit. It also turns out that ternary is actually more efficient than binary when you analyze it in terms of radix economy, which is the rough approximation of how much it costs to write a number in a certain base. Balanced ternary can also be used to solve various balancing problems, as this great video by Math Visual Proofs explained. I won't get into it here, but it is certainly a fascinating take on a classic problem. So let's try writing some numbers in this new base. Even though this is balanced and not regular ternary, we will still use the powers of 3 as the place values. 1, 0, and negative 1 are obviously just the single digits, but what about the number 2? We've exhausted all the possibilities for a one digit number, so we need to use the 3's place. We can use 1, 3 to get to 3, but we've overcounted by 1. No problem for every digit to represent negative 1. And there you have it. To write 2 in balanced ternary, you say 3 minus 1. Let's keep counting. 3 is written 1, 0, and 4 is written 1, 1, just as they are in normal ternary. Next is 5, and again we've run out of options for a 2 digit number. Notice that if we put a negative 1 in the 3's place, and we've used up one piece of negative 3 instead of positive 3, which isn't very helpful for us now. So you need to use the 9's place now. Again, if we stick a 1 in there, we've overcounted. But once again, we have just enough wiggle room to remedy that overcount. 9 is 4 greater than 5, and we can say negative 4 with 1 unit of negative 3 and 1 unit of negative 1. And now you know how to write any positive integer in bounds ternary. The real magic of the system, though, is when we try to write negative numbers. Let's try one. What is negative 8 in bounds ternary? For starters, we notice that it's very close to negative 9, which is a negative power of 3. Specifically, it's negative 3 squared. Not to be confused with negative 3 whole squared, which is positive 9, but you know what I mean. So let's stick a negative 1 in the, th in the 9's place. You notice that negative 9 is 1 too small, so we need to increase our answer by 1, and we know how to do that. Just put a positive 1 in the unit's place. And there you have it. Negative 8 is equal to negative 9 plus 1. And that's not all. Compare the balanced ternary representation of negative 8 to positive 8. Do you notice something? That's right, every digit gets flipped. Indeed, in any balanced base, to convert a number to its opposite or additive inverse, just flip every digit and keep the zeros constant. And here we see that in a balanced base, you can write any real number, positive or negative, without needing a negative sign. 
You might be wondering, what else makes bound spaces interesting? For starters, adding and multiplying numbers in bound spaces can be a bit faster than in standard bases. To see why this is, let's revisit what it looks like to add and multiply numbers using the traditional algorithms, which you likely learned in elementary school. Now for multiplication, there are much faster algorithms these days, even ones faster than Karatsuba's algorithm, which was the first real breakthrough in that sense. But back when bounce ternary computers were being designed, these algorithms were not really known. And for addition, linear time is still the best you can do. Notice how the traditional algorithms require a lot of carrying, when the individual sums and products are too large to fit into a single digit. And often, carries can lead to other carries and a big domino effect. If you do this in a bound space, however, you're less likely to incur a lot of carries. And that's easy to understand when you consider that positive and negative digits will often cancel each other out. And now I'm going to show you how to calculate the probability of a carry in bounds ternary addition, assuming that the digits are evenly distributed. In the first digit, the probability is 2 ninths, since there are two digit wise sums that are longer than one digit. If it's a later digit, the probability needs to get split up based on whether the previous digit had a carry or not. If it didn't, then the probability is still 2 ninths. But if it did, we notice that future carries become more likely. We can combine these using the law of total probability and find that the probability of the second digit having a carry is a little bit more likely than the first digit having a carry. Well, this makes sense when you look at the tables. We can do more iterations of this algorithm and in the long run, the probability will converge to one fourth. Now what about regular ternary? Already with the first digit, you can see that a carry is more likely. But even likelier is a cascading carry from the second digit onwards. Indeed, this number grows much faster than for balanced ternary, and in the long run we converge to one half instead of one fourth. Meaning that overall, carries are about twice as likely in regular than bounds ternary addition. Everyone's favorite computer scientist, Donald Knuth, once wrote, quote, Perhaps the symmetric properties and simple arithmetic of this number system will prove to be quite important someday. I must say he's always been quite whimsical with his work, as I may cover in a future video. Just for a little bit of fun though, I tried working out these probabilities for other bound spaces too, and their non bounds counterparts. And they all converge to the same numbers as ternary, just the larger the base, the faster the convergence actually happens. This makes sense as when you add more digits, the one or negative one that you carry becomes less significant. So that's enough about addition. What else can bound spaces do? Well, for that, we need to talk about another elementary school classic. Do you remember these? These blocks are the way that I was taught how place value works, in the sense that you can uniquely represent any number in decimal by combining these blocks in a certain way. For example, the number 263 is equal to 2 of the 100 block, 6 of the 10 block, and 3 of the 1 block. Since we don't have any sign digits in decimal, or any standard base for that matter, you don't use any blocks that are larger than a number's value. We never use the 1000 block for a 3 digit number. And what it means for a number in our standard basis to have a certain amount of digits, is that it has as many digits as the closest power of the base without going over. But what's wrong with going over? Obviously, if you're playing The Price is Right, the peak American consumerism game show, you're not allowed to go over, though there is a good reason for that. The show's about product placement, after all. The companies whose products are on show want people to buy them. And obviously, people will gravitate to lower prices. Or it could just be that they don't want to deal with ties. Either way, just as an extreme example, let's say you're trying to approximate the price of quite a fancy car that costs $44,000. $865. But let's say you want the approximation to be the nearest power of 10. Is it closer to 10,000 or 100,000? When it comes to what scientists call orders of magnitude, which is classifying a number based on what power of 10 is closest to, they use a logarithmic scale. More concretely, to get a number's order of magnitude, you first convert it to scientific notation. You then look at the number, or the mantissa, and you compare it to the square root of 10. If it's less, then you preserve the exponent. Otherwise, you increase the exponent by 1. So in this case, we do the latter. We find that on a logarithmic scale, 44,865 is closer to 100,000 or 10 to the 5th than 10,000 or 10 to the 4th. But that, of course, does not match how we're taught to round numbers traditionally, which would have you believe it's closer to 10,000. While I do prefer log scales, and I think it would be cool to design a counting system that's based on log scales, balanced spaces follow the more traditional approach. Specifically, the largest number with x digits in bound space b is halfway between 0 and b to the x. And this is exactly what we do when we round the decimal. For example, to round a number to the nearest thousand, we check if the hundreds bar is greater or less than 500, which is halfway between 0 and 1000. In a balanced base, the number of digits in the number tells you what it rounds to. This philosophy of what it means for a number to be a certain length changes your worldview entirely. Imagine a society that dealt with things in a balanced base, or you were designing a language with this principle. Now it places a different kind of emphasis on the powers of the base. Instead of them marking the beginning of classes, they now mark the middle of classes, 
Rounding is trivially easy in the bound space. You just truncate the number. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, this video is getting a bit long. So the last major thing I'm going to talk about is the real life implications of bound spaces. There is one scenario which you have probably haven't realized that we do already use something that roughly resembles a bound space, telling the time. If the time is 3.40, you might say it's 20 minutes to 4. This reinforces the idea that things are usually planned to the hour. And if we're closer to the start of a new hour than the start of the current one, maybe more useful to express time in terms of the future. When you consider an analog clock, that makes even more sense because the hour hand is nearer to 4 than it is to 3. Though nowadays, most people take the time on their phone and not a watch. And phones don't usually show the time in an analog format. Also, also, I greatly prefer to communicate in 24 hour time where possible, but that's a topic for another time. <laughs> Aside from assorted situations like that, balanced spaces would not be all that useful and we should absolutely stick to standard bases. Decimal may not be great for various reasons, but at least it's easy to count in decimal. Keeping track of the pluses and minuses will be very tricky in bound spaces, especially with larger numbers. The number 64 in bound ternary, for example, is 81 minus 27 plus 9 plus 1. How do you communicate that intuitively, especially to young children who are first learning the count? Even if we were used to ternary, or any odd base for that matter, having to switch between adding and subtracting all the time does not match the way we think about counting. It essentially says that sometimes when you increase a number, you may have to decrease the amount of negativeness in the number. Isn't that, isn't that just really, really weird? At the beginning of the video, I mentioned how odd bases write halves suboptimally, but at least they usually only write halves in one suboptimal way. But in bounds ternary, for example, you can write one half in two equivalent ways. It's either zero point infinite ones or one point infinite negative ones. Which one is the standard? It's so confusing. In summary, many people will talk about alternative bases do so because they believe that our human society as it is now would function better if we use a different base. Balanced bases, however, exist largely as a speculative way of reshaping how we think about numbers. They're not that useful to us, but that does not mean they should be ignored entirely. Maybe in a figment of our imaginations, there exists a civilization, humans or otherwise, that survive and thrive on a system with a balanced base. And it's fun sometimes to imagine what could be if we stray from the norms that govern things that we assume to be so simple. And balanced spaces are just one way that you can do that.